Great. Well, uh, my name is Morris Gleason. I'm Education Ambassador with ISOG. Uh, like Debbie, I'm a volunteer that has helped set up the uh, Genetic Genealogy Ireland lecture schedule for this year. And we have a load of volunteers downstairs at the Family Tree DNA stand. So if you are interested in uh, finding out more about buying a DNA test, then please go down and um, introduce yourself and ask any of the volunteers down there. Today I'm going to be talking about the two mothers and baby home and options for DNA testing. Uh, this is also going up on the Genetic Genealogy Ireland YouTube channel uh, sometime after the show, so uh, do feel free to look at this again should you so desire. Now, there has been a huge explosion and revolution in genetics and in genealogy in the last 10 years or so, um, and we really have come a, a long way in terms of the technology that we use for identifying people. Uh, you'll be familiar with uh, Richard III case and the fact that they were able to identify uh, the remains of Richard III from uh, DNA extracted from uh, a skeleton that was found in the car park in Leicester Social Services Department. And that was back in 2000 and, oh, 2012, 2011, that type of time. Uh, we also have uh, the Fromel project from 2009, and I'll be talking about this uh, during the presentation. And this is where they found 250 World War I soldiers, and so far they've been able to identify the majority of those soldiers. And again, DNA played a very large part in that particular project, which uh, started in 2009 and is still ongoing in terms of the identification process. The other big thing that we uh, will be talking about is the huge advances being made in ancient DNA, many of them here in Ireland itself. <coughs> and it serves to just emphasize that we have a huge amount of technical expertise within Ireland. Here is Professor Dan Bradley, who runs um, an ancient DNA lab in Trinity College, Dublin. Um, this was the, uh, this is one of the sets of remains that they found on Rathlin Island. Um, and it dated to 3,000, 4,000 years ago. Um, and this paper was published in 2016, uh, reporting on four ancient Irish uh, genomes. And since then, they have gone up to 100. And we're going to be hearing from Lara Cassidy later on today about what the analysis of the DNA from 100 ancient Irish genomes is telling us. So this serves to illustrate the speed of advancement in this technology. And certainly the ancient DNA labs have taught us a huge amount about what is now possible in terms of extracting DNA from historic remains, from ancient remains, including the remains that are uh, at Tuam. We also had uh, Jens Carlson here uh, two years ago talking to us about uh, the identification of Thomas Kent. And he was moved from um, Cork to... Um, uh, to, he, was, he was moved from Cork Prison where he was interred uh, within an unmarked grave. They knew roughly where he had been buried, but um, they used novel techniques uh, using autosomal DNA to actually identify Thomas Kent. And that particular presentation is up on the Genetic Genealogy Ireland YouTube channel, well worth a view. So the mass grave at Tum has been known since the 1970s because uh, children playing on the housing estate that has now been built around the, the, uh, the old site of the mother and baby home, uh, they would find, they found a pit and they looked into the pit and they found that there were skeletons in the pit and the skeletons were very small and they would have been uh, children. Um, so then in 2014, Catherine Corliss, a local historian, uh, she did a, a project on the, the old home and she found that there were 796 children who died in the home between 1925 and 1961 and there was no record of where they were buried. So the question is, were the 796 children who definitely died in the home, are they buried in that pit that was found on the housing estate on the old site of the home? So this is the old, uh, this is where the, the, the pit lies. It lies under the grass here. And you can see that the locals have put up um, a little um, memorial here in the corner uh, with a statue of the Virgin Mary and some flowers. So that the, underneath all of this grass is where the, uh, the uh, pit lies with these children's remains. And you can see a little uh, memorial here in loving memory of the, those buried here, rest in peace. So, 
when this hit the headlines, then uh, there were a lot of uh, various headlines. That the fact that the pit was it was a disused sewage pit um, was um, uh, mentioned. Um, the tea shock of the day, Anta Kenny uh, made a very very strong statement in the doll, saying we took their babies and we gifted them, sold them, trafficked them, and starved them. Um, other headlines included uh, the, ne the next steps in finding the truth behind their deaths, because the death rate in the Tume Mother and Baby's Home was twice the rate in other mother and baby home homes around the country. So why was that? And that still is a question that desperately needs to be answered. Um, it's so important we get this inquiry right. Uh, the mixing of remains will make it very difficult to identify babies at Tume site. And that particular headline and story made people think that it was impossible to identify these babies when in actual fact that is not the case. Um, it just is another challenge to be overcome. Um, and then uh, in uh, April of this year, uh, several DNA experts, including Professor Dan Bradley and Jens Carlson, wrote a letter to the Irish Times and maybe several other uh, local and national newspapers saying that uh, DNA does now, the DNA technology does now make it possible to identify these children uh, at Tuam. So the names of all 796 people have been published and they're on the internet. Um, you can also research them as well because the first one on the list is a Patrick Durain and you can go to a website like irishgenealogy.ie and you can actually research this particular person. Uh, there's his death record and you can see on his death record that he died on the 27th of August 1928. His name was Patrick Durain, he was male, a bachelor, five months old, son of a farmer. How did they know that this illegitimate child was the son of a farmer? probably because the farmer is actually paying for his upkeep in the home. And a lot of people in the Tume Mother and Baby's Home, they, the children did not come from underprivileged backgrounds, they came from middle class backgrounds. And so a lot of the times their upkeep would have been uh, sustained by a member of the local community. He died of gastroenteritis, which he'd had for two months. Um, the the uh, informant was Sister Hortense, um, and you see that uh, on a lot of the, the death certificates with Sister Hortense was the person that registered the death, and her address is uh, the children's home in Tume. Um, so that's the kind of information that you can get on the Irish genealogy uh, publicly available data. Um, so there's, but there was a huge social stigma, of course, associated with illegitimate children uh, back in Ireland, which uh, was perpetuated up, up, up until the present day. Um, family trees can be constructed, but only on the mother's side, because this death certificate doesn't tell us anything about the father, apart from the fact that he was a farmer. So we don't actually know who the, the father was, but we might be able to assume that Durain was the name of the mother, and that's why he was called Patrick Durain. Now, that may not be the case. Maybe it was the name of the father. But for most illegitimate children, they took the name of the mother rather than the father. Tomb Home Survivors Network issued a press release in January of this year, and there's three interesting um, items, uh, number three, number five, and number six. Let's see if I can underline them. Yes, number three. Uh, the, the, the members of the network said that the appropriate actions uh, uh, need to be taken and they uh, recommend recovery and relocation to be undertaken with all the expertise and resources necessary to preserve as possible the individual identity of each set of remains. Because as, um, as humans decompose, uh, the bones tend to become separated. So it's important when you're trying to um, exhume uh, individuals that you try to retain the integrity of the skeleton and keep the bones together. Uh, the second uh, point they make is the taking and cataloging of DNA from all the remains to create the most complete database possible. So creation of a database. And the third an invitation to be extended to all those who have reasonable grounds to believe that members of their family may be buried at the Tuam site to provide their DNA. So it's the creation of a comparative DNA database. It's interesting that they've just kind of um, honed in on those people who have reasonable grounds to believe that they have a relative buried there. Uh, and we'll come back to that because it is a very specific subsample of the entire Irish population. So these are the current um, objectives of the Tomb Home Survivors Network that are relevant 
to DNA testing, uh, preserve the individual identity of each child, create a database of all the children's DNA, all the children in the pit, and invite selected families to provide DNA for comparison. So that was in January. Then in, um, uh, when did this report come out? October 2017, uh, this is when it was finalized, but we had the technical report on the Tuam site from a technical expert group. And it's a very large report, 219 pages long, but many very useful portions, and it is a very, very, it's a great read, actually. It, they have some excellent recommendations here that I think a lot of people in the press, but also possibly in government, have looked, have overlooked. But there's a lot of very good uh, recommendations within this report. They describe the type of approach to examining the remains in the pit and tomb as humanitarian forensic action. So this is going to be undertaken by a forensic company, but it's not necessarily treated as a crime per se. It's a humanitarian forensic action, the same type of action you'd undertake if there was a plane crash and you were trying to identify the bodies in the, on the crash site. So uh, there are multiple challenges that they identified. They repeated um, uh, on many occasions that a pilot study would have been preferable before the publication of the report, but they were under pressure to actually get it done. So uh, since then, I think they have done a pilot study, but I haven't seen that information publicly released as yet. They also talked about how it is important to have a multidisciplinary body to implement the strategy. Uh, they make the point that forensic genetics is non-standardized. There's no standardized way of doing this investigation. And every time there is a new mass grave and they come in and they do this humanitarian forensic action, they discover something new and the technology advances with every single case. So you're looking at a state where the uh, technology is changing and evolving all the time. And if we do it at Tume, this will help the evolution of forensic genetics as well. Now, um, so there's been many recent advances. I think many of the, the suggestions in this report were actually possibly ignored by, by government. Um, I th think the public consultation that took place after this was uh, published was premature and the public did not have enough information to make an informed decision about what they felt was the best way forward. But in 2017, they did a geophysical survey at the Atuum Baby site and it did detect uh, remains within the pit. So this is what it looks like uh, now. They've taken off the grass and the pit is lying there. It's been cordoned off. Here it is on an old map um, overlaid on a, a current version of uh, Google Maps. You can see that this is the area, the Graston area, and the pit lies underneath that particular area there. And here in outline you see the old buildings of the mother and baby's home. And this is the estate that has popped up all the way around it. So the site is actually hemmed in. If I go back to the last slide, it's hemmed in on all sides by people's gardens, making it uh, quite uh, difficult to access this particular site. But there is a, a sizable portion of the expert technical report that describes how um, excavations could take place, and uh, the take-home message is it's difficult, but it's possible. Uh, there are 20 underground chambers within the larger pit, um, uh, which measures about 12 metres by 2 metres. Um, there are bones present in 17 of the 20 chambers, and it has been previously entered. So well, there are reports from the locals about how uh, children got in there, or people were accidentally fell in or were pushed in for a joke. And the, so that raises the question that is there contamination uh, within the pit from other people that have actually entered it? At Formel, they exhumed 250 sets of remains, and this is what it looked like. You can see everybody's wearing their uh, crime scene investigation type suits, and they um, catalogued every single thing. Now, they could use the same kind of suits in Tuam, or they might have to use whole body suits. And that means that they look like um, a deep sea diver with the, the tubes going in, uh, so it, and they can only stay in those suits for 40 minutes at a time, and then they have to get out, take a break, and then go back in again. So it may very well be that uh, they'll have to wear these whole body suits. Again, it's just an extra level of complexity that can be overcome with modern technology. 
All the artifacts facts will be logged, the chain of custody established. Uh, the possible recovery team might include a forensic archaeologist, uh, a forensic anthropologist who will, be, who will be looking at things like the height and the sex and the age of the remains, looking for any fractures, any evidence of bone disease uh, uh, that could possibly tell us the cause of death. It may also involve a historian, a photographer, a project manager, and the genetic side of the team may include a forensic geneticist, maybe even a genetic genealogist, um, and also a statistician. Uh, other people on the team may include experts in ethics, because ethics play a huge role in this type of project. This is how the soldiers at Fromel were catalogued. So before even removing anything, you're drawing diagrams of the sets of remains and the positions that they're in. The position of the remains are recorded. Every individual bone is mapped. Are some of the remains going to be intact? Will they be disassociated and the bones scattered? Um, it very much depends on was the sewage pit active for some of the time that the children were in there? And it may be that it was active between 1925 and 1937, but between 1937 and 1961, um, it may have not have been used as a sewage pit per se. So the challenges are to recover the intact individual remains and to re rebuild individuals from scattered bones. So DNA may help because you can test individual bones and find out which person it belongs to, but it may be too destructive. Uh, so for example, in the case of Richard III, they used a molar tooth, and there's a YouTube video uh, showing how they uh, processed that molar tooth, and it mean, meant pulverizing the tooth first, uh, turning it into a powder, and then taking the powder and extracting the DNA from that particular powder. So the question is, where do we draw the line? How many bones need to be reconstituted with an individual? And that's an ethical question that will need to be discussed by the multidisciplinary team that does this work. Here's a site of the Fromel um, dig, which uh, the, you can see that there's eight mass graves indicated beside the wood, and they created this um, temporary uh, lab and temporary mortuary where all the remains were laid out, catalogued, and then they would extract the tissue sample for later DNA analysis there on that uh, makeshift lab. So we'd do the same kind of thing at Chewham, and there in the yellow circle is the actual pit, and you can see that there are fields nearby, and it may very well be that there will be a, a, a procession of activity from the housing estate uh, to a nearby field where they'll set up a temporary um, lab and a mortuary. So how can DNA help? It can help in three different ways. First of all, the identification of individuals, the reunification of bones, and the discovery of trafficked children, because there's no guarantee that those death certificates were real. And we know from recent stories that a lot of them would have been faked and the child would have been sold to an American couple, for example. So, uh, and that's something that Peter Mulryan um, is uh, concerned about because when Catherine Corliss found that he had a sister who apparently died in the home, the big question was, well, did she really die in the home or was she actually sold to uh, an American couple and adopted in America? So this is a very important question that um, people need to have answered. And if you want to find out if your relative was trafficked, do the Ancestry DNA test. Download a copy of your results to your computer and then upload it to Family Tree DNA, My Heritage, Living DNA, GEDmatch. And if you don't find the answer there, then do the 23andMe test, uh, which is a separate company. Uh, you will be putting yourself in touch with 20 million people. The databases are roughly around about 20 million uh, people now. Um, so, like Debbie said in her first presentation, uh, there's a very, very good chance that you will find, if, if your relative is adopted by an American couple and has done a DNA test, you will find them in by, by doing this technique. So, test with Ancestry, transfer to all the other companies. If you don't find them there, test with 23andMe. Individualization is the second way that DNA can help, and there are ethical issues here as well. Which DNA tests will suffice? Do you do the forensic tests? And we'll look a little bit about them later on. Um, or do you do more uh, formal tests like the ones we do for genetic genealogy? 
some of the smaller bones will be destroyed by the testing. So does it make sense to test the smaller bones if you can't then reunify them because they've been destroyed? Uh, where do we draw the line? What to do uh, with them if they can't be reunified and rejoined with their owner? So there's a need for expert specialist advice and the multidisciplinary board should include an ethicist who will be able to address some of these questions. And then again, who makes the final decision? Is it the board? Is it done publicly? Is it done privately? These are all questions that need to be addressed. <coughs> so when we come to uh, taking DNA from the actual samples, there is a process that we use. First of all, you need a tissue sample. And this, in living people, we, we do a cheek swab or, or we spit into a, into a little tube. In deceased people, you're looking at maybe a tooth or a bone. Um, the petrous bone uh, in, at the back of the skull, just behind your ear, is the hardest bone in the body, and you get the best yield of DNA from this particular um, bone. Uh, DNA extraction, two elements here, the quantity and the quality, and we look at here. We look at, the, at those issues as well. The testing, uh, we need to look at the three types of DNA, Y-DNA, father, 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 mitochondrial DNA, mother, 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 autosomal DNA, but also the two types of DNA marker, the STR marker and the SNP marker, and the three approaches to DNA testing, the forensic approach, uh, the commercial approach, which is the tests that we do, and then the ancient DNA approach. Um, then we need to actually create a comparative DNA database and that means either using anti-mortem samples, uh, targeted individuals, or the general population, which may be a forensic general population or a, a GEDmatch general population. We'll look at that. And then to establish the identity of the person, you can never be absolutely sure that you have identified the right person. Um, we'll see with Richard III that they were 99.9994% positive that it was Richard III. Um, and the same with Thomas Kent as well, but I'll show you a little bit of evidence about that. And again, what threshold should you use for identification? Do you need to be 99% positive, 95% positive? What's the threshold that we choose for saying this person is definitely, th these remains belong to this named person? So these are the kind of issues that we face um, with the whole process. But let's look at the tissue sample first. And um, here is Kendra Sirak from University College Dublin. Um, she developed a new method of extracting DNA from the petrous bone that is minimally destructive to the remains. This is technology that was developed in Ireland. Just to emphasize again, we have the technology within Ireland to do the right thing. Uh, the DNA extraction depends on quantity and quality because once you get your tissue sample, and you know there's DNA in that tissue sample, the question is, Will you be able to extract DNA from that sample? And there's two problems here. The first problem is that DNA fragments after death. So you only have these small, short segments. And environmental conditions are very important about how rapidly the DNA degrades. Age is less of a problem. Um, but it, uh, th this fragmentation can be very problematic for the forensic STR-based tests because um, they may not be able to test, to detect this fragmented DNA. Uh, I said age is less of a problem because we were able to extract DNA from Neanderthals that were 38,000 years old. Um, but on the other hand, Titanic, 1912, 100 years ago, um, three graves were exhumed in 2001. There were no human remains left in two of those three graves because they, the, the, the ground was actually very waterlogged, and water speeds up the degradation process. So you can have DNA surviving for 38,000 years, or bones surviving for 38,000 years. You can have bones gone within 100 years. So what are the conditions going to be like in the pit in a tomb? DNA can remain intact for a long time, can de de decay rapidly depending on the environmental conditions, the best conditions are cool, dry conditions, and that's why you find uh, a lot of the Neanderthals would have been buried in the back of caves um, where the conditions were very, very uh, conducive to the survival of their bones. Many remains of tomb may be gone because apparently it was active as a sewage pit until 1937. So for those uh, years between 1925 and 1937, there may be no bones left. 
So that might be a substantial proportion of the children's remains won't have survived. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, of course, is that because it's a sewage pit, the soil in that sewage pit may be quite acidic. And um, you all probably have heard about the bog bodies that are found in the bogs from time to time. Impossible to get DNA out of them at all because the acid is very good for preserving the skin, but it destroys the DNA completely. So those bog bodies in the National Museum of Ireland, they weren't able to get DNA from them at all. Moving on to the type of DNA testing, there are three main types of DNA. Uh, like I say, the Y DNA goes back along the father, father, father side. It's useful for establishing a connection on that direct male line. Father, father, father up, son, son, son down. The mitochondrial DNA does exactly the same on the other side of the family tree, the mother, mother, mother line going up and a mother, mother, mother line going up from the uh, match. So mother, mother, mother up, daughter, 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 daughter uh, coming down. Autosomal DNA is the third type of DNA and that tests all of the chromosomes apart from the Y chromosome, which is the father, father, father line. Um, so it tests all of the other chromosomes and that is the most useful from a genealogical point of view. Uh, the Y DNA and mitochondrial DNA are good for deep as well as recent ancestry, but autosomal only useful for recent ancestry, going back about five, six, seven generations, and that of course would be within the time period for the children at Tuam. Two types of DNA marker, just so you're aware of it. Um, here we have the double helix uh, of the DNA, it's unraveling, and then you've got the two strands. One is a mirror image of the other, so that's why you see DNA code just written as a string of letters, because on the other strand it's exactly the opposite mirror image. G always binds with C, A always binds with T. This gives us two types of DNA marker. The STR marker is a short tandem repeat, TAC, TAC, TAC. So TAC is repeated three times. The value for that marker is three. That's where you get the numbers from. Uh, the single nucleotide polymorphism is a single substitution. Uh, it might have been a G in the, in the father, and now it's an A in the son. So an STR is a string of letters. A SNP is a single letter. Those are the two types of DNA marker. And both of them are used both in forensics and also in genetic genealogy. So what are the options for degraded DNA? You can use standard forensic tests. You can use chip-based technology like we do for genetic genealogy, just like uh, the test you do at Ancestry or Family Tree DNA. Or you can use whole genome sequencing, which is now what they're using in Professor Bradley's lab in Trinity College Dublin, in uh, Professor Ron Pinhazi's lab in the uh, University College Dublin as well. So we have two ancient DNA labs within Dublin itself, and they are very much on the forefront of um, promoting these new technologies. So these are the kind of tests that you could do. I just want to draw your attention to the fact that the forensic tests use maybe 23 STR markers on the Y DNA. We use 111 on the STRs, 85,000 or more on the SNPs. There is an order of magnitude different difference between the forensic tests and the genetic genealogy tests. <coughs> mitochondrial DNA, they can use full mitochondrial sequence, so can we. Autosomal DNA, they use a 17-panel STR marker. We use 700,000. 17 versus 700,000. Which means that these tests that we use for genetic genealogy are much more able to detect uh, relationships that are second cousins, third cousins, fourth cousins, whereas the forensic uh, autosomal tests, these ones here, will uh, identify a child, identify a parent, perhaps identify an uncle or an aunt, but that's as far as they will go. Very, very difficult to detect a first cousin, and anything beyond first cousins is practically impossible with a forensic DNA test. So major advances in ancient DNA have informed what is now possible technologically. And I think in the future what's going to happen is that with these type of humanitarian forensic actions, we will be doing either whole genome sequencing, like Professor Bradley is doing in his lab in, in Trinity, or uh, we'll be doing a SNP-based test. And uh, Professor David Reich in Harvard University over in Cambridge in America, he is developing a chip which tests about 1.2 million SNP markers. And that may very well lower the cost 
of doing this type of investigation quite considerably. Um, we had a meeting with uh, some one of the commercial companies recently, and they reckoned that uh, in the Tuum case, they could extract um, autosomal DNA uh, using their chip, which has 700,000 markers on it, for somewhere between 500 and 1,000 uh, euro per case. So if there's 796 individuals, that's going to be 500 to 1,000 per 796 individuals. You're looking at about 800,000 euro, which is not going to break the bank. It actually is economically feasible to test these children. Looking at the DNA for comparison, so we have now extracted DNA from all these children. How, what do we compare them to? You can compare them to an anti-mortem sample, for example, in the case of Princess Anastasia, where the individual who claimed to be Princess Anastasia and who had died many years before, they were able to, once the DNA technology had evolved, they were able to go and get a, a sample of tissue that had been uh, removed from her in the local hospital, test that for DNA and compare it to the DNA of Prince Philip, who is also on the direct female line with Princess Anastasia. It proved that there was no match whatsoever, and it proved that this lady who claimed to be Princess Anastasia was not, in fact, Princess Anastasia. You can also target individuals, and at Fermel, we knew that the 250 missing soldiers belonged to a list of 1,650, but the question is, which of the 1,650 are the 250 we found in the pit? And so what they did was they collected, they traced the families of all 1,650 people and they collected DNA samples from each of those families and compared it to the soldiers' uh, DNA that they had collected. Uh, so they needed 6,600 donors to identify 250 soldiers. Again, challenging but doable. The third type of reference database you can uh, use is a, a reference database from the general population. Uh, and that might be either a forensic database, like the CODIS database, or it could be GEDmatch, which is the public database we use for genetic genealogy. And that has now about 1.2 million people in that particular database. Then, once you've got your comparison, in order to establish the identity, what do you need to do? Well, with um, uh, Richard III, we targeted his descendants, and we found Wendy Duldig and Michael Ibsen, and doing an analysis um, of his mitochondrial DNA, we, we were able to determine that this was, these were the remains of Richard III, with 92% probability based solely on his mitochondrial DNA, but when you take all the other evidence into account, the scoliosis, the uh, crooked back, um, they came to the conclusion that these were the remains of Richard III with 99.9994% probability. And this is uh, described in great detail by John Reed in a wonderful lecture that he gave at Who Do You Think You Are a couple of years ago, and that is up on YouTube as well. So if you want to see the Bayesian probability statistics that were used to determine the probability and the likelihood ratio of this being Richard III, then please look at John Reed's uh, video. In Fromel, they used a slightly different approach because they had to, they were collecting DNA from uh, 1,650 families, and they were collecting two Y DNA samples from each family and two mitochondrial DNA uh, samples from each family. The reason it was two was because they knew that there was a risk of adoption within the family, so they couldn't rely just on one Y DNA sample. And in fact, they found that within the sample of 1,650 people, um, or families, there was a 2% incidence of adopt adoptions or illegitimacy within these families. The, uh, they then, if, if they couldn't find an informative Y DNA donor on, say, the soldiers, uh, f you know, if the soldier didn't have any male brothers, then they went up a generation to see if he had any male first cousins. Um, and we have something here. This is, oh, the batteries. Lovely. Thanks very much. Um, and if they didn't find it at the, first, at the generation above, then they'd go up a generation further. So for some of these soldiers, they had to go back to the 1800s in order to actually uh, identify informative DNA donors. And then what they used was a combined probability measure to decide uh, 
whether this was likely to be the soldier using the, you know, the Y DNA had to match and the mitochondrial DNA had to match. And using that technique, they were able to get odds of something like the chances of it being a chance match are one in 64 million. So that's the kind of statistics that they did for Fromell. But of course, we can't do that at Tuum because we don't know who the father was. So therefore, we've got no way of tracing the father's family. We could trace the mother's family, assuming, in the example I gave Patrick Durain, we're assuming that the Durain referred to the mother's surname rather than the father's surname. So uh, there are problems using this technique uh, with the children at Tuam. But the technology has moved on and major advances have been made since Richard III and since Fromell. Um, and again, a lot of it was uh, spearheaded by the ancient DNA labs. This is Professor Dan Bradley's lab. And uh, this was the paper that I mentioned before. The whole genome sequencing looks at 3 billion letters, not just 700,000, 3 billion letters um, in every, uh, on your genome. And this started uh, in 2012, and it, because it's getting more advanced, the price and the cost of doing this type of testing is coming down all the time. Uh, Jens Carlson, of course, uh, we mentioned previously, analyzed the long lost remains of the executed 1916 rebel Thomas Kent. Um, and his presentations on uh, the Genetic Genealogy Ireland YouTube channel. And here is some actual data from uh, Professor Bradley's paper on these first four ancient DNA genomes. And the things that just to, this is very technical, but the coverage, they managed to get uh, a 10, 10 times coverage, 10, 10 times deep coverage uh, for um, two of the samples and around about one times coverage for the remaining two. Um, and that was a pretty good result. Um, they were able to, able to establish the mitochondrial and Y haplogroups. And then with Thomas Kent, they managed to get 26% human DNA from the samples. The rest was bacterial DNA in the soil bacteria. Uh, they had a very low read depth, usually only one read per sniff, same as these ones here. There was virtually no, no heterozygotes. So they analyzed the whole thing as homozygotes uh, as a half genome, and that had to change, that changed the uh, numbers, the percentages they used for the statistical analysis. Um, but the odds that the identification was wrong was less than one in a million, and the likelihood ratio was five trillion to one, more likely that he's related to the nieces than not. So they didn't have any uh, informative Y DNA, they didn't have any informative mitochondrial DNA, they only had two nieces, and they were only related on the autosomal lines. Now, we also had Buckskin Girl in April of this year, and this started this whole revolution of law enforcement use of DNA on JetMatch. And this was uh, the identification of Marcia L. King. Uh, his case was taken on by the DNA Dope Project, and they managed to extract blood from a 37-year-old blood sample um, from 1981. This particular girl was found uh, murdered at the side of the road, and nobody knew who she was. For 37 years, this blood sample had uh, remained in the custody of the police without being refrigerated. So they managed to extract DNA from an unrefrigerated blood sample from 37 years ago. They then uh, sequenced that DNA. Um, they uh, spoofed a kit, created a spoof kit, and loaded that up to a jet match. In fact, they did this several times because this was all new technology. They weren't sure how it was going to work. But um, though the, I don't know whether it was 10 or 20 or more spoof kits that they did, but uh, every single kit was able to identify the same close matches on JEDmatch. And as a result of that, um, they were able to detect a first cousin once removed match. They found uh, a tree on Ancestry that was associated with that particular email address. And within four hours, they had identified who this person was. So it took 37 years for forensic science to throw everything at this case and fail, and four hours for genetic genealogy to answer the question. And that really is a very, very important illustration of the power of genetic genealogy to help solve these type of cases. Uh, they contacted her mother, and uh, her mother hadn't changed her address and hadn't changed her phone call because she was hoping for the last 37 years that she would get a phone call from her daughter and say that everything was okay. 
So the take-home messages are that there have been major, major recent advances in DNA technology. The extraction of autosomal DNA is very possible, and we have that technology here in Ireland. Sufficient SNP profiles can be generated for comparison with samples from living people, whether they're targeted relatives, like we did at Fromel uh, and Richard III, or whether it's from the general population uh, using a, a database like GEDmatch. Uh, the approach is very similar to what has been done by the commercial direct-to-consumer companies and GEDmatch. You, uh, DNA from a prospective family can be compared against the entire database of the DNA of the children in the grave at, at uh, Chum. And a list of matches can be generated and identification is possible based on those matches. There are ethical issues surrounding identification. Before qualifying for DNA comparison, people must have reasonable grounds to expect to be related. This is what is recommended by the Chum Home Survivors Network. But what are those reasonable grounds? Where do we draw the line? A first cousin? A second cousin? Uh, who decides who qualifies? Is there, is there going to be an ethics committee involved? What if some family members do want to test and some don't? How do you resolve that ethical conflict? There's a very important uh, additional question. Is there a case for identifying all the children in this grave and tomb? and not just the children of those families who come forward saying, I think I've got a, a child, can you take my DNA and compare it to the children's database? Because Chum is wider than just the locality. It actually is important for every single person in Ireland, and every single person globally as well, <coughs> because what happened at Chum may very well have happened in other mother and baby's homes around the country, and it raises important questions like, do all the children deserve to have their name on their gravestone? I would say they probably do. But again, where do you draw the line? Because if you go back maybe 60 years from Tuam to the famine, how do we approach the famine graves? Do those people deserve to have their names on their gravestones? Or is the famine so far back in history that we're prepared to forget about it in terms of actually identifying individuals? I don't know the answer to that question. Do the families involved deserve to have their privacy protected? Absolutely. Um, but to what extent? Because if we are, are, is there an element of trying to hide again from the truth? And is this a, a, a vestigial uh, remains of the stigma still operating today? So those are very, very difficult questions to answer. And I certainly don't have any, uh, any answer to that particular question. Could the identification be done without publicity? I think absolutely. We can do it privately and create the necessary safeguards so it's done um, outside of the media glare. Uh, using GEDmatch to identify the children is another option. So you're using a public database to identify all the children in the pit. Again, spoof kits could be generated just like they did with Buckskin Girl and Golden State Killer. Um, the file uploaded to GEDmatch in the usual way. Do we compare it to the entire GEDmatch database, or do we create our own opt-in database for comparison purposes? The matches generated for each child, then some of them will have trees on GEDmatch, some will have trees on Ancestry, MyHeritage, Genie. Some can be contacted for genealogical information, if need be. The identity of the child can be deduced and then confirmed by subsequent targeted testing of suspected families. But is that a step too far? I, you know, just because it's technically possible, just because we can do it, doesn't mean we should do it. And that's where the ethical dilemma arises. And we've been using this technique with adoptees for the last eight years. Um, this is what GEDmatch looks like. It's a public database. There you can see the total amount of DNA shared. Um, there's the largest segment. There it tells you whether there's a match on the X chromosome. There's emails for contacting people. You can see my email there. Um, most of these names, well, some of these names are pseudonymized so that you can't tell the exact identity. Uh, and then you can see here that some people have JEDCOM. Uh, you can click on that and you can get the family tree. Um, so what kind of relationships to expect? What family members will come forward? We might get a parent coming forward. It's possible. It's because it was up to 1961, so the parent could be born in the 1940s so they may still be alive. And if their DNA is put into Jet, jet Match, then you'll get this kind of prediction that 100% um, chance it's apparent. 
If it's a sibling, again, you can put the, the, the DNA in and it comes back 100% chance it's a sibling. If it's a half sibling, that'll, it detects that as well. It'll also detect nephews and nieces. It'll go to first cousins, and now we are beyond the, the realms of forensic DNA testing. It'll also go to second cousins, and it'll give you a, a prediction about uh, the, the likely relationship. So prob probabilities for each relationship can be calculated statistically, and this is the power of genetic genealogy over forensic genetics. The last ethical issue is memorialization. What happens to the remains after you've extracted the DNA, uh, done the testing, and completed the post-mortem inquest? Are they buried? Are they put in storage? That's something that the multidisciplinary uh, body will need to decide. And where are they buried? Do the gravestones have a DNA ID number and no name, and the name can then be added at a later stage if identified, and that's the technique that they used in Fromel. And at Fromel, they built a purpose-built cemetery for the 250 soldiers, buried them, and then uh, as identifications occurred, and they've identified 159 of the 250 soldiers so far, as identifications occurred, you can see here that the gravestone was changed from a soldier known unto God to a soldier with his actual name and identity written on his gravestone. We could do exactly the same thing in Chewham, give an unknown child gravestone and change it as identification occurs to a, uh, a named individual, uh, and thereby of, uh, giving the children a dignity in death that they probably did not have in life. So it, I need to acknowledge the, the amazing work of Catherine Corliss, um, whom I've spoken to on a few times on the phone, uh, John Cleary, who is here as well, who's done some great work with ancient DNA, Debbie Kennett, of course, as well, um, Martin Curley, that I've, who, who lives in the Galway area, I've had some uh, conversations with him, uh, Professor Bradley and uh, Janice Carlson for the work they do in their, uh, with their teams in the ancient <coughs> DNA labs, and of course the expert technical group who wrote that uh, very, very useful report that I would encourage you to all read, it's freely available, and then my, my ISOG colleagues uh, for the many discussions we've had on Facebook about a lot of the issues um, involved in this particular case. So I will leave it at that and say thank you very much for your kind attention. Now, we, we do have time for a few questions, so I'm going to ask Donna, would you be kind enough to move the um, microphone around? That would be great. That lady over there, Anna. Um, hello. I've been <coughs> going crazy to come in. My name is Anna Corrigan and I belong to the Chewham Babies family group and we have 11 family members buried in this pit. So we seem to be getting sidelined here, we're not mentioned. Uh, we are an active group and we've been active for quite a long time. Uh, we have half siblings in there, we have aunts, we have uh, cousins in there. So we seem to be, as I say, as Ministers Paul has called us, um, stakeholders. I mean, how we become stakeholders in our own family is beyond belief. Now, the grave does exist because uh, running in tandem with Catherine's research in 2013, I got a letter from the Bon Secours stating that the grave did exist, despite what Cherry Prone said. Mm. I put uh, one of the young lads in touch with Catherine, uh, uh, Barry, <coughs> Barry Sweeney, he's a friend of mine, and he had found the bones. <coughs> now, whether they're the same bones, I don't know. Um, regarding um, the expert technical group report, I mean, there was a rebuttal to that sent in by the expert team in uh, UCD. Um, yeah. It was sent in by uh, Jens Carlson because uh, Jens Carlson was of the mind that uh, the DNA can be extracted from the petrous bone. It doesn't matter the commingled state of the bones because you only have one skull. Uh, the, this is the cutting edge technology. He said it can be done at a very cheap rate. He's already done it with the Thomas Kent thing. This again is being ignored. Um, Dan Bradley came on board. Um, uh, David McHugh, uh, they all put their submission into Ministers of Bone. 
because we know for a fact from the report that was written by the expert technical group, it is not a valid report. It's, it sidelines a lot of issues. They won't use up-to-date current technology. I spoke to the DNA expert involved. I asked him and I asked him about Jens Carlson's work and he said, um, mm. and I said, why did you not apply that to June? Mm. So the, we've also got rights here under the Coroner's Act, which people are forgetting. This is all nice and tidy and everything else. I have two brothers and they're the subject of two open police inquiries. And one of them is marked as dead in the ledgers of the home, despite the fact that he's not on the list that Catron compiled of the names. Mm. And I also have another brother who's the subject of an open police inquiry, that he died of neglect and malnutrition, because I have the paperwork which I gave to Catron. Now, you're talking about the ethics here. I mean, before we ever get to the ethics, the names are already out in the public arena. Catherine, anybody can walk and get a copy of that list because their name, their date of birth is on it. They can go into the GRO, they can secure a copy of that person's birth certificate because there's no restriction <coughs> over it. It will show the mother's name. The plaques have already been done. They're down, they were, they were put together by the Graveyard Committee uh, in June and they're sitting in Mayo. That was the last I heard of them. So all these names are out there following Catherine's research. Mm -hmm. So there is no ethical um, issue here. Um, I think one of the things that struck me about the Tune Home Survivors Network press release was the fact that there was, um, uh, there seemed to be, understandably, the families in the surrounding area that gave the children up for, to be put into the home. Um, is it, is there a risk there that people will name and shame them? Well, first off, I don't speak on behalf of the Tum, the Tum Survivors Network. We're the Tum Babies Family Group. Again, we're being sidelined, right? We've been around a long time. But we, but then nobody will interact with us because we actually have family members mm -hmm. in the grave. Now, whether you put your child into the home, that name is never going to come out. We're only looking at the names of the children that have actually died, which are already out in the public arena. Mm -hmm. So there is no taking them back. They're already out there. The plaques were ready to go up just before the uh, breaking of the story by Alison O'Reilly from the Mail on Sunday, which when I brought the story to her, mm -hmm. right? Um, we have absolute rights here because this is... Um, a criminal scene, right? I mean, I spoke, you, you talked about the Vox Populi that was done by the Galway County Council on foot of uh, Catherine's and Cohen's mm. issuance of saying, right? I spoke to the Dublin City coroner and I asked him, where in the world, following the find of human remains, would you go to the public at large? And in this case, it wasn't the public at large. They came to Dublin and they went to Chum mm. with a distinct uh, agenda of what they wanted to do. Would you ask the public, what would you do with the find of human remains? He yeah. said, nowhere. Yeah. So I said, I go home now and I find bodies buried in my backyard and I'll go to the shop and I'll ask Mary, should I grow some roses over them? Mm. Not a hope in hell. Now also regarding this expert technical group report, we know they used the wrong technology because I have been liaising with the experts behind the scenes that put the rebuttal in. Now, again, this is all getting very, very confused out in the arena. We have family members in the grave. Mm -hmm. We have rights. Dame Sue Black said every child under 18 is entitled to an identity. There's case law in the European courts that could be based that we have rights, that those children have rights. You know, once again, if you're saying don't say about the child's name at all, we have the same issue with people who were illegally adopted. We have the same issue about people who were adopted. Tell them nothing, keep them in the dark, you know. These names are all out there for clarification. Mm -hmm. And these names are not secret. So that blows the issue of the ethics of, in that respect out of the window. Sure. We have 11 family members in the grave. We are entitled to know what happened to our family. Well, and again, sorry, as I said, the sure. Tune Survivors Group, they speak on behalf of survivors. They have one member in there, to the best of my knowledge, which is Peter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, as I say, we're, we don't have any angst, but I'm just saying, we do sure. have actual. So I would like to get that message out, because we are being held back, we are being sidelined, 
We're being pushed into obscurity, but we do have family members. I have two brothers, Annette McKay has a sister, Professor Thomas Garavan has an aunt. I have another lady, Rita, I'll only give you her first name, who has a sister and a brother in there. I can go on, I have a, a person who has two cousins in there, and we're all just waiting, jumping at the bit, to be recognised, to be acknowledged, to get our rights under law, to have the DNA testing done, not to have to read the expert technical group report. We want to read the rebuttals that Professor, uh, that was put in by uh, Jens Carlson two ministers upon on foot of our ex marxist spot sure. so we have rights and we want our rights established cool thank you very much for your comments <laughs> um i think that it is very important that we have these kind of public discussions i think it's very important that the message gets out there that we have the technology and that's why the fact that this is being broadcast on facebook live as we speak is one way of getting the message out and the fact that this uh presentation is actually going to go up on the YouTube channel is another way of spreading the words and hopefully serves to inform general public opinion. Now, uh, unfortunately we're out of time, but uh, Barbara, you're next to you? Yes. Yeah, so Barbara is the next speaker. No, that's fine. Um, but you'll be interested in, in Barbara's talk because um, Barbara is the person that actually identified the Golden State Killer in California using these exact techniques that we are talking, that I've mentioned here. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Barbara, but I'd just like to thank you for your comments. Uh, there will be a panel discussion after Barbara's talk, and uh, maybe some of the issues that have come up can actually be discussed then at that point in time. Thanks very much for your kind attention.